Chapter 3 Feathers Filling a Great Sky Night fell and the Shemire flew on tirelessly, their shapes black against the falling snow. The coils showed no signs of relaxing, though Alric strove to force them apart, keeping tight hold of his rune sword and racking his brains for some means of defeating the monsters. If only there were a spell. He tried to keep his thoughts from what Thaleb Ka'ana would do if indeed it was that wizard who had set the Unai upon them. Alric's skill in sorcery lay chiefly in his command over the various elements of air, fire, earth, water and ether, and also over the entities who had affinities with the flora and fauna of the earth. He had decided that his only hope lay in summoning the aid of Philete, Lady of the Birds, who dwelt in a realm lying beyond the plains of earth, but the invocation eluded him. Now, even if he could remember it, the mind had to be adjusted in a certain way. The correct rhythms of the incantation remembered, the exact words and reflections, inflections recalled, before he could begin to summon Philip's aid. For she, more than any other elemental, was as difficult to invoke as the fickle Ariok. Through the drifting snow, he heard Moonglam call out something indistinct. What was that, Moonglam? he called back. I only sought to learn if you still lived, friend Alric. All right, barely. His face was chill and ice had formed on his helmet and breastplate. His whole body ached both from the crushing coils of the Shemira and from the biting cold of the upper air. On and on through the northern night they flew, while Alric forced himself to relax, to descend into a trance and to dredge from his mind the ancient knowledge of his forefathers. At dawn the clouds had cleared and the sun's red rays spread over the snow like a blood over Damask. Everywhere stretched the steppe, a vast field of snow from horizon to horizon while above it the sky was nothing but a blue sheet of ice in which sat the red pool of the sun. And tireless as ever, the Shemire flew on. Alric brought himself slowly from his trance and prayed to his untrustworthy gods that he remembered the spell aright. His lips were all but frozen together. He licked them, and it was as if he licked snow. He opened them, and bitter air coursed into his mouth. He coughed then, turning his head upwards, his crimson eyes glazing. He forced his lips to frame strange syllables, to utter the odd, vowel-heavy words of the high speech of old Melnibane, a speech hardly suited to the human tongue at all. Philete, he murmured. Then he began to chant the incantation, and as he chanted the sword grew warmer in his hand, and supplied him with more energy, so that the eldritch chant echoed through the icy sky. Feathers fine our fates entwined, bird and mine and thine and mine, formed a pack that God's divine hallowed on an ancient shrine, when kind swore service unto kind. Philete, fair feathered queen of flight, remember now that fateful night, and help your brother in his plight. There was more to the summoning than the words of the invocation. There were the abstract thoughts in the head, the visual images which had to be retained in the mind, the whole time, the emotions felt, the memories made sharp and true. Without everything being exactly right, the invocation would prove useless. Centuries before, the sorcerer kings of Malnibane had struck this bargain with Philete, Lady of the Birds, that any bird that settled in Imria's walls should be protected, that no bird would be shot by any of the Malnibone in blood. This bargain had been kept, and dreaming Imria had become a haven for all species of birds, and at one time they had cloaked her towers in plumage. Now Alric chanted his verses, recalling that bargain and begging Philippe to remember her part of it. Brothers and sisters of the sky, hear my voice wherever you fly. Bring me aid from kingdoms high. Not for the first time had he called upon the elementals and those akin to them. 
But lately he had summoned Ha Stark, Lord of the Lizards, in his fight against Thelib Ka'ana. And still earlier he had made use of the services of the Wind Elementals, the Sylphs, Shanars, and Hahashans, and the Earth Elementals. Yet, Philippe was fickle. And now that Imrera was no more than quaking ruins, she could have chosen to forget that ancient pact. Philippe, he was weak from the invoking. He could not have. He would not have the strength to battle Thalab Ka'ana, even if he found the opportunity. Philippe. And then the air was stirring, and a huge shadow fell across the Shemire, bearing Alric and Moonglum northward. Alric's voice faltered as he looked up, but he smiled and he said. Thank you, Philippe. For the sky was black with birds. There was eagles and robins and rooks and starlings and wrens and kites and crows and hawks and peacocks and flamingos and pigeons and parrots and doves and magpies and ravens and owls. Their plumage flashed like steel and the air was full of their cries. The Unai raised its snake's head and hissed, its long tongue curling out in front of its fangs its coiled tail lashing. One of the Shemirai not carrying Elric or Moonglum changed its shape into that of a gigantic condor and flapped up towards the vast array of birds. But they were not deceived. The Shemira disappeared, submerged by birds. There was a frightful screaming and then something black and pig-like spiralled to the earth, blood and entrails streaming in its wake. Another Shemira, the last not bearing a burden, assumed the dragon shape, almost completely identical to those which Elric had once mastered as ruler of Melnibane, but larger and with not quite the same grace as Flame Fang and the others. There was a sickening smell of burning flesh and feathers as the flaming venom fell upon Elric's allies. But now more and more birds were filling the air, Shrieking and whistling and cawing and hooting, a million wings fluttering, and once again the Unai was hidden from sight. Once again a muffled scream sounded. Once again a mangled pig-like corpse plummeted groundwards. The birds divided into two masses, turning their attention to the Shemire bearing Elric and Moonglum. They sped down like two gigantic arrowheads, led each group by ten huge golden eagles which dived at the flashing eyes of the Unai. As the birds attacked, the Shemirai were first forced to change shape. Instantly, Elric felt himself fall free. His body was numb and he felt like a stone, remembering only to keep his grip on Stormbringer. And as he fell, he cursed at the irony. He had been saved from the beasts of chaos, only to hurtle to his death on the snow-covered ground below. But then his cloak was caught from above, and he hung, swaying in the air. Looking up, he saw that several eagles had grasped his clothing in their claws and beaks and were slowing his descent, so that he struck the snow with little more than a painful bump. The eagles flew back to the fray. A few yards away, Moonglum came down, deposited by another flight of eagles, which immediately returned to where their comrades were fighting the remaining Unai. Moonglum picked up the sword which had fallen from his hand. He rubbed his right calf. I'll do my best never to eat fowl again, he said feelingly. So you remembered a spell, eh? Aye. Two more pig-like corpses thudded down not far away. For a few moments the birds performed a strange, wheeling dance in the sky. Partly a salute to the two men, partly a dance of triumph and then they divided into their groups of species and flew rapidly away. Soon there was no birds at all in the ice-blue sky. Eric picked up his bruised body and stiffly he sheathed his, sto- his sword, Stormbringer. He drew a deep breath and peered upwards. Philippe, I thank thee again. Moonglum still seemed dazed. How did you summon them, Elric? Elric removed his helmet and wiped sweat from within the rim. In this climb, the sweat would soon turn to ice. An ancient bargain my ancestors made. I was hard-pressed to remember the lines of the spell. I'm mightily pleased that you did remember. 
Absently, Ulrich nodded. He replaced his helmet on his head, staring about him as he did so. Everywhere stretched the vast, snow-covered Lormirian steppe. Moonglum understood Elric's thoughts. He rubbed his chin. I, we are fairly lost, Lord Elric. Have you any idea of where we might be? I do not know, friend Moonglum. We have no means of guessing how far those beasts carried us, but I'm fairly sure it was well to the north of Yosas. We are further away from the capital than we were. But then, so must Thaleb Ka'ana be, if we were indeed being born to where he dwells. Hmm, that would be logical, I agree. So we continue north? I think not. Why so? Well, for two reasons. Could be that Thaleb Ka'ana's idea was to take us to a place so far from anywhere that we would not interfere with his plans. That might be considered a wiser action than confronting us and thus risking our turning the tables on him. Hmm, aye, I'll grant you that. And what's the other reason? We would do better to try to make for Eosas, where we can replenish both our gear and our provisions and inquire of Thaleb Khan's whereabouts if he is not there. Also, we would be foolish to strike further north without good horses, and in Eosas we shall find horses and perhaps a sleigh to carry us faster across the snow. Yeah, I grant you the sense of that too, but I do not think much of our chances in this snow whichever way we go. We must begin walking and hope that we can find a river that is not yet frozen over, and that the river will have a boat upon which it will bear us to Eosas. A faint hope, Elric. Aye, a faint hope. Elric was already weakened from the energy spent on the invocation to Philippe. He knew that he must almost certainly die. He was not sure that he cared over much. It would be a cleaner death than some he had been offered of late. At least painful death than any he might expect at the hands of the sorcerer of Pantang. They began to trudge through the snow. Slowly they headed south, two small figures in a frozen landscape, two tiny specks of warm flesh in a great waste of ice. <laughs>